Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? Hey, if this is your first time here or we've never met, my name is Chris and I'm the associate pastor here. And I just want to say it's good to see your faces. I'm glad to be here with you guys this morning. Let me start off with a quick question. This is purely, I'm curious, I'm not going to judge you based on your answer. How many of you like soccer? That's awesome. I don't. I really don't like soccer. I have tried so hard to get into it. Listen, I know, I know, I, but here's the deal. I can't watch the games on TV. I've tried. I, I can't really understand all of the rules. I don't get all of the games sometimes. And if I'm just being honest with you guys, I think it's the inferior version of football. Now, before any of you try to stone me from the stage, let me say this, okay? I do think that soccer can be really entertaining in person. But, in fairness, so can most sports. But as much as I don't like soccer, my wife and I have become obsessed with a TV show that's literally all about soccer. It's a show on Apple TV. It's called Ted Lasso, and it's one of the greatest things I have ever watched. It's a fictional story of an American football coach who goes to England to, co uh, to manage a club for a premier team in London. And it's this really cool story of, of unexpected things happening that he doesn't... Um, sorry, my brain just went completely blank on me. <laughs> but he flips expectations. He doesn't do things the way he's supposed to. And so what's interesting about this story is not so much the soccer. But really what's interesting about this story is that you have this guy who comes in and he does the most unexpected things. And so a lot of times what Ted Lasso does would have been considered unorthodox, but he does it anyway despite all of the, the feedback and pushback that he gets on it. And what's really interesting to me about this story is not the soccer so much, but really it's the fact that you have this coach who his primary objective isn't to win, which feels kind of backwards, right? If you're a coach you might want to win some games. But that's not his goal. In fact, his whole goal is to help people be the best version of themselves. And so what I think is so cool about this, this show and this story is that it shows the kind of impact you can have when you make people your mission. Now, there's somebody else who made people their mission, and his story is far more impactful and captivating than Ted Lasso ever thought about being. And that person is Jesus. If you were going to sum up Jesus' ministry and mission in one word, it's people. That Jesus, he didn't come to build a kingdom for himself. He came to save the world from sin. And so he died on a cross. He sacrificed himself for a broken world. And what's even more interesting is that when you look at Jesus' ministry, a lot of times these big moments in there, they don't happen in front of these massive crowds, but they really happen in these one-on-one -on -one interactions that Jesus has. And even more interesting than that, Oftentimes, these one-on-one -on -one interactions that he has, they're not what the people you'd expect them to be. In fact, oftentimes, Jesus found himself interacting with the sinners, the unclean, the outcasts, the people who are kind of pushed away from society. And so these are the very people that maybe you think they'd be the last people who would talk to Jesus. And maybe you even think they'd be the last people that Jesus would talk to. But those are the exact kind of people that Jesus came to reach. Jesus said this in Luke 19, 10 to the crowd. He said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So Jesus' ministry, it's always been about people, no matter who they are or what they've done. That's what he came to do. And so for us, if we are going to be a reflection of Jesus, you need to understand that as the church, our mission is the exact same. And Jesus, the way he did this was he wasn't afraid to go against the norm. In fact, Jesus oftentimes, he would go against societal traditions. Or he wouldn't follow the laws of the Sabbath that the Pharisees had put in place. In fact, Jesus, by the end of his ministry, actually flips an entire religion on its head just to reach people. And so as the church, we have to be willing to do the same thing because that's still the same mission that we have. Our mission, it's still people. That Jesus, he gave us a simple goal when he talked to his disciples. He said, look, go and make disciples of all people, all nations. And so here's the deal. If we're going to do that, if we're going to reach people like Jesus did, then you need to understand that means that we have to reach all people, not just some people. It means that we reach people who are like us, but also people 
who aren't like us because that's the way Jesus did it. And so as we talk about this today, here's what I want us to know, that if if you're going to reach people like Jesus did, you need to respond to people like Jesus did. So we're kicking off, or sorry, finishing up our sermon series, Mind Games, this morning. And what we've been doing is for the past five weeks, we've been taking a look at how our thoughts and our responses to different things can affect our well-being and our relationship with God. And today what we're looking at is how our thoughts about people can actually affect our responses to people. So if you have your Bible or Bible apps, you can go ahead and open those up to Matthew 8. That's where we're going to be this morning. And before we get into Scripture, I want to give you a little bit of background. I kind of want to set up the story and tell you where we are at this point in the Gospels. So by Matthew 8, Jesus is still very early on in his ministry. Now, right before this, Jesus has just completed what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. And this takes place in chapters 5 through 7. And the Sermon on the Mount happens right, before, or right after Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. And in the Sermon on the Mount, this is where we get some of Jesus' first controversial statements. It's the first time that we see Jesus start to kind of flip the law and religion of Judaism on its head. Now, as a quick plug, if you're interested in learning more about the Sermon on the Mount and what that looked like, Well, come back next week. We're kicking off a sermon series called Upside Down, and we're going to take some weeks together to study the Sermon on the Mount in depth and look at what did it really look like for Jesus to change a religious system for the better. So join us next week for that. But where we are in our story right now, Jesus, he's starting to gain some fame. He's starting to gain some notoriety. But he's not quite as famous as he'll get later down the road. And so at this point, Matthew 8 tells us that he is starting to draw some crowds. But what you'll find is interesting about Jesus is that early on in his ministry in particular, Jesus, he didn't really like operating in these big moments. And so a lot of times, again, you start to see these small interactions that Jesus has. And oftentimes when Jesus would heal someone or perform a miracle, he would actually look at that person and tell them, hey, keep it a secret. Because Jesus, he wasn't interested in being famous Jesus, at this point in his ministry, his really big focus is just helping on people and and loving them and serving them. And so as we get to our story today, Jesus is leaving the mountain, and he's going back to Capernaum. And this is where scholars believe was actually Jesus' home for a big portion of the Gospels. And as he's on his way back home, Jesus is going to have an unexpected interaction with someone. So let's start looking at, this is verse 5 through 6. It says, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. So as Jesus is on his way back home, the first thing that's going to happen is he's going to be interrupted by a centurion. He meets a Roman centurion. Now, if you aren't familiar with history of the Bible, you need to understand something here. That Romans and Israelites didn't really get along together. At this point in time in the Bible, Israel had been under Roman rule for about 90 years. So it's not that shocking, and it's not an exaggeration to say that Israel did not like Rome, and vice versa. And and this isn't even just an ordinary Roman or even an ordinary Roman soldier. This man is a centurion. He's an officer in the Roman army. So this is the kind of person who would have been a unanimously hated man. And the centurion, he'd have been really well aware of that. But he still approaches Jesus and ask for healing. So it's worth stopping here and and starting out with this question this morning. Why? Why does the centurion feel comfortable approaching Jesus? There's some interesting things you need to know about what's happening at this moment. And one of the big things that you need to talk about is authority. Now, a smart response for you back to this may have been, well, He's an officer in the army, and he's a Roman, so he's got a lot of authority, a lot of power. So maybe here, this man would have just felt obligated. He would have felt he absolutely had every right to be around Jesus and to approach Jesus here. And that's a fair argument to make, but that's not really the attitude that we see from the centurion. In fact, first, you need to understand that the New Testament actually portrays centurions often in a very good light. And so usually when you see a centurion, they're portrayed as an honorable, good man, not the kind of person who demands things from people. But also, when the centurion approaches Jesus, he actually gives Jesus a title. He says, Curie, Lord. 
And that's not the kind of title you throw around lightly, especially if you're a government official. So this is not the kind of man who's demanding things from Jesus. This is a man who has approached Jesus humbly, and he's pleading with Jesus. And here's why. The centurion, he knew there's something different about Jesus. The way he preached, the healings he performed, even just the very way that he interacted with people was different than any other Israelite the centurion had seen up to this point. But more than that, the centurion knew that Jesus cared about people. So here's the deal. As the church, we're supposed to be a reflection of Jesus. And so what that means is that we're supposed to be the place where people can come to answer, for answers and hope and forgiveness. People should feel just as easily like they can approach us as a centurion did that he could approach Jesus. But that's not often the reality in America. In a study done by NPR in 2020, researchers have now suggested that by as early as 2070, the number of Christians in America will drop from 66% of the population down to below 50%, that we will for the first time become the minority religion. And if you think that 2070 sounds like it's a far, a long time away because it's 50 years, for people in the room, I, I don't mean to do this to you, but the 1970s, that was 50 years ago. It's not that long. And even back in the 1970s, the number of Americans that identified as Christian was at times as high as 90%. So here's what that's telling us. The church, it's declining. And it'd be easy to go, well, that makes sense because you know, the world, it's, it's not a spiritual anymore. America, America just doesn't care about religion. But that's also not true. Last year, there was a study done by the Barner Research Group, and they found that 77% of Americans are open to the concept of God or a higher being. But what's more interesting than that is they also found that 44% of Americans said that they are now more open to spirituality and religion than they were before the pandemic. So here's what that tells us, is that America, for the first time in a long time, is actually very open to the concept of God and religion. But they're not looking to the church for those answers. And i got to be honest with you, it doesn't really shock me that much. I mean, just think about the way that our culture thinks and talks about the church and Christianity. I mean, even just some of the words that are thrown out about us are hateful, mean, bigoted, exclusive, manipulative, hypocritical, just to name a few. Our culture looks at church as this money-hungry organization that doesn't care about people. And we know that's not true, but here's the problem. This is how I see most Christians respond to this that we'll look at someone and we'll go, hey, I mean, not all churches are like that. How convincing? That's just words. All you did was tell them some words. You know, in 2018, I was a high school teacher and a football coach. And during that time, I inevitably got to listen to a lot of 16-year-old boys say a lot of stupid things. But more amusing than anything else they did was argue about the amount of weight that they could lift. And so it never failed. Almost every single day, two of them would start button heads about something and they'd start arguing about how much weight they could lift. And of course, one of them, out of the blue, makes this outlandish claim of this ridiculous amount of weight that he could lift. And what is the response back? Oh yeah? Well, prove it. And so like clockwork, I would watch this boy with chicken legs put 315 pounds on a squat bar. And he'd walk up under it, he'd pick it up, he'd take a step back, and he'd collapse like a cheap folding chair because he couldn't hold the weight. See, all the talk in the world doesn't matter if you don't back it up. So the same thing's true for the church. See, people don't care about your words until they see that you care about them. And so we can have every proof every convincing argument about why the church really does care about people, why the church really does love like Jesus. But if people don't see us back that up, if they don't see that lived out, 
Just words. Just words that fall on deaf ears. And see, this is why I think the centurion was actually so comfortable approaching Jesus. Because for that centurion, there was no doubt in his mind that Jesus cared about people. He knew it was evident by everything that Jesus did. That Jesus, he didn't just tell people he loved them, but he showed it. See, that same thing has to be true for us. That we can't just tell people that we love them. We have to show them that we care with more than just our words. See, see Jesus' mission was people. And so what he did throughout his ministry was focus on people. And so more important to him than preaching and teaching was serving people. It was the majority of his ministry. That Jesus, he didn't just talk about his love, but he demonstrated his love for others. It's the same thing that we have to do. You know, we have a missions partner here at the church. It's called Hope Impacts. And you've probably heard us talk about it a lot with suppers and showers. They do an awesome ministry. Uh, Two days a week, they provide a hot meal and a hot shower for homeless people here in Katy. It's an incredible mission uh, organization. And we serve with them typically about once a month as a church. Uh, But we also just found out recently that they're actually struggling to get volunteers. They have a ton of weeks where they don't have a single person signed up for food, volunteer, anything. I want you to think about something for a second. Think about the amount of churches that there are. Not not in Houston, just here in Katy. Now, I want you to think about the fact that an organization that, that serves the homeless, the least of these, can't find people to help them. It's not right. That's the church, and I'm not just talking about Care City. I'm, I'm talking about the big C church here. The church has to step up. We're supposed to show the love of Jesus, show people that we care. I mean, how cool would it be if we as Care City filled some of those vacancies for them on top of the regular serving that we already do? We got to do that for them a couple of months ago in January, and it was an awesome thing because people are just blown away by the way that you love them when you do that, not just the organization, but the people that we served. See, this kind of stuff matters. It makes a huge impact for people to see that you love them and not just hear that you love them. And there are tons of ways you can serve. We have ways that you can get involved here at the church. Just a couple of our teams in particular that we're looking for things right now. Our kids' ministry. We want to make sure that our kids have the biggest impact possible, that we want to make a huge impact in the younger generations. And so we're trying to find some new leaders that can help make that the best environment possible. Worship ministry. If any of you have musical talents, We want to be able to lead people in engaging worship, and you can be a part of that. And even setup team. I know that it seems mundane to come in here and set up some chairs and some pipe and drape on Sunday mornings at 7 o'clock. But the people that do that, they're helping to create an engaging and welcoming experience for people to worship God. It matters. What we do matters. The way that we show our love matters a lot. Now, you don't just have to serve in the church. You also have the ability to serve for different missions partners. We have uh, Hearts for Heroes is one of our missions in the church that's run by one of our members, Stacy Wilkins, and they do an incredible job working with at-risk veterans in the Cloud Break uh, District, or Cloud Break District, excuse me, that is something from our Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Wow, <laughs> Cloud Break facilities in Houston And they actually have monthly opportunities for you to go hang out and do Bible study with the veterans. But we also have an organization, Two Lives Change. Robbie Perrin is the executive director for that. And they do a great job helping young single mothers navigate pregnancy and being a mom. And we have opportunities to serve with them. Right now, our women's ministry is doing a donation drive to collect supplies for them. But you're not tied to just serving in the church. I want you to know that you also have the ability to serve outside of here, that it doesn't require a church event for you to show the love of Jesus. In fact, something as simple as you buying the person behind you in line a cup of coffee can actually do a lot for someone. It shows the love of Jesus. So here's what I want to challenge you with on this. Be the hands and feet of Jesus. It's good for people to hear that the church is different than the way the culture perceives it. But we got to show it. we got to back that up. So my challenge to you is make people your mission. Let your actions speak louder than your words because it matters. All right, let's keep reading. This is verse 7. 
It says, Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Now, we'll stop there because this is a really important verse that I want to talk about for just a minute. I think one of the best ways that we can learn to respond to people like Jesus is to not look at people like they're inconveniences. Now, at this point, I want to remind you that Jesus, he's leaving Sermon on the Mount, right? So he's probably getting ready to go home and go get some much-needed rest. But he stopped, and he's approached by the centurion. And there's this interesting thing that Jesus does right here. He stops everything he's doing, and he's willing right there in that moment to go to the house of the centurion. I mean, it doesn't even say that he hesitated. Scripture doesn't say that he stopped and pondered or looked to his disciples and was like, hey, what's our schedule look like? Like, do we have, is everything planned out okay? It's not like he stopped and said, okay, well, let me, let me pray about it, and I'll get back to you on that. No, right in that moment, he said, let's go. And this shocks the centurion. Look at what he says in verses 8 through 9. He says, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And so what's happening here is that the centurion, he's starting to make excuses and reasons as to why Jesus doesn't have to come to his house. He goes, look, here's what I understand about you. I understand you're a Jew, and I understand in some capacity, I don't get it, but you have authority. And so I, I understand that I am not worthy of you, so you don't have to come to my house. In fact, you can just heal him with words. I know you have the power to do that, so, so don't bother coming. Just heal him from here. But Jesus... He's willing to go the extra mile. He's willing to go to the house of the centurion, even though he doesn't have to. It's because to Jesus, the centurion's not an inconvenience. In fact, Jesus' ministry, it's so often centered around interactions with the very people that we would probably deem inconvenient or troublesome. Blind Bartimaeus, the woman at the well, Gerasene demoniac, Zacchaeus, paralytic lowered by his friends down through the roof. Just some of the instances where Jesus is stopped, interrupted, or approached by someone who really had no business being around Jesus. Never bothered Jesus, though. He was always happy to help, give up his time to serve others. And what's crazy is that these little moments often ended up being some of the most impactful moments in Jesus' ministry. And the same thing is true for you. So if you want to reach people like Jesus, you need to embrace the interruptions in your life. You know, when you're going out to dinner and a homeless man stops you and asks you to buy him dinner, it's not a bother. It's actually an opportunity for you to show the generosity and the love of Jesus. And when your friend calls you and asks to go to coffee and talk about their struggles for the hundredth time this month, that's not wasting an hour of your day. It's showing compassion and empathy like Jesus did. See, it's easy to look at situations like this as inconveniences when you forget what your mission is. But it's why you got to constantly remind yourself that your mission's people. And what's interesting is that something as simple as taking time out of your day and showing someone that you care about them and being there for them makes a monumental difference in their life. You know, when I was a student pastor in Georgia, I also led our college ministry. And we, in the fall of 2020, had a new student come join us for our college group that first night. And he was this quiet freshman. He's a football player. And he had this crazy, crazy busy schedule. He was trying to graduate early. And so he managed to come for like the first couple of weeks, but pretty quickly his schedule in football just overtook all of that. And so he wasn't able to come to church on Sunday mornings or come to group on Thursday nights. And so in the moment I decided, okay, he can't come to group, so I'm just going to go to him. So I called him up and I said, hey, here's what I want to do. Once a month, let's get lunch. We'll eat, we'll hang out, we'll talk together. That's it. And so that's exactly what we did. About once or twice a month, he and I would get together, we would have lunch at a sandwich shop, and we would just talk about life and hang out. And there was nothing monumentally crazy about what we did. In fact, the best thing about our hangouts 
was the sandwich shop we ate at because for whatever reason, LaGrange, Georgia has the best sandwich shop in the world. And they have hot peppers that I'm fairly certain are a gift from God. But that's the best thing about it. That's the only thing that was super spectacular about what we did. Everything else was just a regular lunch. Just talking about whatever was on his mind and what had happened the month before. But something as simple as that made a huge difference in his life. Because that next semester when he had a really rough season of college, was something that helped him get through it. It matters. And now... That student, he's a student pastor and a football coach up in Georgia, and he's getting to show the same love to other people that was shown to him. But see, that's what it looks like to show people they're not inconveniences. It looks like taking time out of your afternoon at home with family to go serve those who are in need. It looks like being a shoulder to cry on or a person to pray with for the thousandth time. It looks like getting lunch with the quiet college freshman. It's showing people that they're worth your time, your energy, and your effort. And C.S. Lewis said this about interruptions. He said, the great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions in one's own or real life. The truth is, of course, that what one calls the interruptions are precisely one's real life, the life God is sending one day by day. But here's the deal. The people in your life, they're not an inconvenience. Those interruptions, they're the very people that God's placed in your life. So I want to encourage you, embrace the interruptions because they're powerful moments to show someone the love of Jesus. All right, let's keep reading. These are our last verses today. Starting in verse 10, it says, When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. And when I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go and let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. So remember, just a couple of verses before this, we have the centurion who recognizes Jesus' authority. Now what you need to understand is that the centurion, he doesn't know everything about Jesus. He doesn't understand really anything about Jesus. But what he does know is that there's something different about him. There is something divine about Jesus. And that leads him to have faith that Jesus will heal his servant. And what's cool is that when you get to verse 10, you see that Jesus, he's amazed by this. In fact, he turns and he goes, look, I haven't seen a faith this great in all of Israel. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to declare something to the people around him. That he says that Gentiles would enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you don't know what a Gentile is, it's just somebody who's not a Jew. And so Jesus says they'll be in heaven But not only will they be in heaven, but they'll actually get to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, this is a big deal because if you are a follower of Jesus at this point and you're a Jew, your entire belief about heaven has been that only Jews would be in heaven. But now you've got Jesus saying that not only will Gentiles be in heaven, but never in your wildest scenario would you have imagined that they would get to sit with the founders of your faith. But that's exactly what Jesus came to accomplish. See, the centurion, he's not the exception to Jesus' ministry. He's the very person Jesus came to reach. See, the last way that we can learn to respond to people like Jesus is that we can learn to reach the people Jesus died for. And spoiler alert for you, that's everyone. And so reaching people like Jesus means that we learn to love and serve every single person, not just the people like us, but the outsiders, the people who are different, the very people who would least expect it from us. That's what we're called to do. Jesus said it this way in Mark 2, 17. He said, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
See, reaching people like Jesus doesn't mean that we're building a country club of Christians. It means that we're on a relentless pursuit to reach the lost. So here's the deal. We should be turning heads by how well we love the people who are different than us. And so if we're going to love people like Jesus, if we're going to show the grace of Jesus, and we're going to reach people like Jesus did, that's going to change everything about the way we love. It means that we have to love the LGBTQ community well. That we love those who've had abortions. That we love the liars, the thieves, the murderers, the criminals, everyone. It means that we love the very people who least expect us to do that. That's what Jesus did. And that's what flipping expectations looks like. See, the world, it expects the church to love the people who are easy and good. But loving the people who are different hard to love that's a different kind of love it's the kind of love that catches people's attention makes people ask questions it's the kind of love that leads people to the gospel you know when I was at my church in Georgia we had this student who eventually became a part of our student ministry and the first time I met him I learned that he was notorious at his school and the reason was is that he had gotten caught participating in what we'll refer to as extracurricular activities with a girl out in the woods. And so he learned or earned the nickname, The Outdoorsman. So that's how I was introduced to this kid. And so I had all these high school boys that I would go eat lunch with. And every single time I'd show up, they were like, man, I, we really would love for him to come to church. We would love for him to know Jesus, but there's just no shot. Like he has no interest in it. And I don't think he'll ever step foot in the church. But I had two guys who were adamant. They were like, we, we want to see this happen. So I was like, okay, well then don't give up. Show them love. Keep loving them well. Keep inviting them to church. You never know what will happen. One day, after very repeated annoyances, he finally showed up. And I'll never forget the first time he came, he rode in on a motorcycle wearing nothing but a leather jacket because, and I quote, I wanted to feel the breeze. He looked so out of place. But when he walked in that church, those kids welcomed him with open arms. And because of that, he came back the next week. The week after that, the week after that, eventually, the kid gave his life to Christ. And eventually, he started serving in our children's ministry. And there's this picture that used to hang on the walls in the church, and it was one of my favorite pictures I've ever seen. I get chill bumps every time I think about it. He was serving with the children's ministry upstairs, and they were dancing to music. And, and you know, like you think about a high school boy that's just too cool for school, so they're usually in the back like, yeah, Jesus, yay. No, there's this picture of him. I'm talking like hands are in the air, his hips out, just the biggest smile on the planet. And it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen because he's the very last person you would have expected to be in church, the very last person you would expect to know Jesus. But he's the exact kind of person that Jesus died for. So my kids, these students, they didn't look at him as an inconvenience. They didn't look at him as, as a problem or trouble. They looked at him as somebody that Jesus died for. And so they dedicated themselves to showing him the love of Jesus and sharing the love of Jesus with him. Because of that, the kids' eternity has changed forever. See, here's the deal. You get to have that same kind of impact on the people around you. I need you to understand that you can play a monumental part in changing eternities for people in the city of Katy. It's not an exaggeration. But in order for you to reach people like Jesus did, you've got to respond to people like Jesus did. You know, our church's name is Kara City, and if you're new here or you just have no idea what that means, I'm going to tell you a little story our church name is not just some modern, trendy church name that we decided on, but it actually, the word charis means grace in the Greek. 
And we chose this word because that's who we want to be. That we want to be a church that doesn't just talk about grace, but that we show intentional grace one person at a time. That we take the love and the truth of Jesus to a broken world. That we love everyone. No matter who they are or what they've done. Because that's who we want to be. So here's my challenge to you today. Let's do it. Let's be that church. Let's not just talk about the love and the truth and the grace of Jesus, but let's show that grace to a broken world. Let's reach people like Jesus did. Because if we'll do that, we'll be blown away by what God will do in this church. Let's pray.